This morning's passage is concerned to show you really one thing, and that is to show you about the greatest king that Israel had in its history, King David. This passage is all about showing the greatness of David whenever he was at the peak of his power and the peak of his influence. And we're going to look at three separate things about what this passage tells us today. We're going to first look at what's this telling us? What made David a great king? Why is he a great king? Um, we're then going to look at a wee bit about maybe what it means for us, about how, although we maybe don't want a king, we deep down do need a king. And then finally, we're going to look at how this passage points to a future, uh, a future coming king, a perfect king. So first thing we're going to look at is there is a great king in this passage. If you are a Jew, you are focused on one thing, which is when is the son of David going to return? When is the great king, this moment where we were at the peak of our power and the peak of our influence, when are we as a people and a nation going to get back to that time? And whenever the writer was writing this, he was trying to convey how great David was to give that sense of, wouldn't it be great to get back to the time when David was king? Up until now, the way that 2 Samuel reads is, this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. But what's interesting is whenever we come to chapter five, the chronology of what's happened is maybe not exactly in that order of a blow by blow account. Um, and that might throw us off, but probably what that means is that the author is trying to convey something to you that is not just, here's what happened in the life of David. Rather, what the author is trying to do is say, look at all these things that David did that show you how great a king he really is. And so he goes through this big list of things in chapter five, showing all the different ways that David was the best king that Israel ever had. And we're gonna look at just four of them this morning. The first thing we see in verses one to three is that David's a great kin king because he's a humble king. Did you, look at what, did you notice what happened when the elders came to David? They said, we are your own flesh and blood. They said, David, you're one of us. You're one of our kin. It's not that David has descended from a sort of celestial body and it's not that he has come from some magical, mythical place. David's one of them. He's a humble ruler who's flesh and blood, who's off their family and off their kin. And then they go on to say that in times past, whenever Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. Now, if you were in the ancient world, what the king was supposed to do was he was meant to lead by example, being out of the front, front fighting with his men, leading and fighting with them in battle. But what we see here is that whenever... David wasn't even king. He was acting like king by doing that. And Saul, the previous king, was nowhere to be found. David was the one acting like the king over Israel whenever they really needed it and whenever things were dangerous. David was a great sort of humble king who would lead from the front and be with the people. And then they go on to say another thing. They go on to say that there's also a promise wrapped up in David where David was promised to be the shepherd of his people, to care for his people. In the ancient world, kings weren't really known for their caring, kind nature, but not David. David is going to be the king who will be like a caring shepherd to the people of Israel. And even the fact that they say that he's appointed not by men, but by God, shows that David isn't a greedy, power-grabbing sort of king. He's a king who's there because he realizes that he is a king under God's authority. He's a humble king. The second thing that this shows us is David's a king who provides his people refuge. If you look down at verse 6 and onwards to verse 10, we read about this battle that takes place uh, around Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem was the city that we read about a lot in the Bible. Jerusalem is a city placed up on top of a hill called Mount Zion. So whenever we hear Mount Zion said or Jerusalem said, that's the same place in the Bible. And at this point in the Bible, the people of God aren't in Jerusalem. There's no temple. There's no kingdom based there. there is a, but there is a massive fortress. And the fortress is inhabited by a people called the Jebusites. 
We don't know very much about the Jebusites. Um, this is the only place that we read about them taking, or the place of them living in the Bible. And what, what, it, what the Mount Zion fortress that they live in is kind of functioning as, it's like a big outpost right in the heart of Israel's territory. It would be like us having a foreign nation's army base right in the middle of Northern Ireland somewhere. It's functioning as this fortress from which they can go out and launch raids, but for the most part, because they're in this impregnable city on top of a hill, nobody can get at them. And because they think this fortress is so strong, so unbeatable, they turn to David and say, even the blind and the lame could fend you off this. And then, and we're not entirely sure what the water shaft refers to, but we read that David, using a water shaft in some way, is able to attack the city and claim it. And David texts this, what was a great fortress, and he uses it for his own people. And he establishes his throne there. And what's interesting is because he takes Jerusalem, because he takes a city that wasn't belo- didn't belong to any other of the tribes of Israel, it begins to function almost like a, a functional state capital, the way that Canberra in Australia might work or the way that Washington DC might work. David's not having to take land off somebody else so that he can give himself a really impressive city. He's able to take it from somebody else so that he's able to keep a sense of political persuasion in the area. But also, and this is probably the most important thing about this, Jerusalem in the Bible will come to mean something so much richer than just a big fortress on top of a hill. Because Jerusalem and Mount Zion are going to come to represent the presence of God being with the people. Where their refuge is and where their stronghold is, is where their God is who's in the temple that's going to be built in a few generations' time. And this is promised, maybe not explicitly as Mount Zion in the Bible, but God has promised all the way back from Abraham that he would plant his people upon a hill and they would flourish. Genesis 15, uh, we read that on the day the Lord had made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your offspring, I will give the land that is from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Canaanites, the Camonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephamites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God has promised this city that belongs to the Jebusites all the way back in Genesis, to Abraham. And it's going to be the place where God dwells, where he later goes on to say in Exodus, God promises people that he will bring them out and plant them on a mountain and place the Lord which he has made for them, a sanctuary. And the Lord will establish the work of their hands and the Lord will reign with them forever and ever. And he will have a sanctuary that he will dwell in their midst. Zion's going to come the place where it's not just a refuge of a military sort, it's a refuge where people can go to be with God. It's where David's son, Solomon, who we read off there in the closing verse, Solomon's going to build a great temple there. And this is going to be a city and a capital that shows a refuge that isn't just a military strength, but a refuge that's found in God. God gives, or David gives his people refuge, and so he's a great king. And the bit we didn't read in this passage, but you can tell even just by reading the the heading, David's a conquering king. We read in verses 17 down to the end of the chapter how David goes out and defeats the Philistines on two separate occasions. And the Philistines are like the constant bugbear of the people of Israel. If there is a battle to be fought, most of the time it's with the Philistines. And here we see David going out and conquering the Philistines and defeating them. And you can imagine people reading back on this and saying, look at David defeating the age-old enemy. But what's interesting is how David defeats them. If you look quickly down at verses 19 and at verse 23, we read that before David goes out to defeat them, he asks for God's help and for God's counsel. And we read in verse 24, As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly because that will mean that the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike down the Philistine army. It's not just that David is a great military victor who's going and smiting the enemies of Israel. 
David's doing this with the guidance of God, with the support of God, and we see that his victory isn't even because David's a particularly great tactician, but it's because he's got a great God. So David is able to go out and conquer his enemies because David's a king who doesn't just follow his whim and his fancy, because David is a king who follows God. And that's the fourth reason why he's a great king. Do you see the greatest compliments that could be paid to David in this passage in verses 10 and 12? We read that David, in verse 10, became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. And verse 12, that David knew that the Lord had established him as king forever over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. David becomes a great king because David has a great God. David hasn't made himself king. He's not trying to make his own reasons or his own arguments. But he knows that he's a king because God has put him there. And what makes him a great king is that he's a godly king. And because God is with him, God is with Israel. And that's what means that, or that's what allows this wonderful chapter filled with successes and victories to take place. What allows all these wonderful things that happened in David's life, leading up to in the final 10 years of his life, whenever a king of Tyre will send materials for him to build uh, his great uh, castle and kingdom around him. It's all because of God's faithfulness. Because David is with God, God is with David, and the kingdom flourishes. And this will be the kingdom that everyone in Israel is trying to get back to. This is going to be the kingdom that up until this day, Jewish believers will still be looking for the new king, King David, who will come back again and will make everything better. The king who will make everything okay. And we have a similar urge in our hearts. We want a king, but we don't want a king. What do I mean by that? I mean that as much as we like to think of ourselves as people who are autonomous and think for ourselves and don't look for anybody for leadership or don't are able to know our own minds, there is part of our hearts if we will be honest with ourselves, there is part of our hearts that is longing and searching for a king like David, for somebody who will come again and make everything okay. It's in the stories we tell our kids. You know, we might tell our our kids stories of uh, King Arthur, King Arthur, who was the great king in English history, who was able to go and defeat all his enemies, who had the Knights of the Round Table and Camelot and all that. And what's inscribed upon King Arthur's tomb um, is is the Latin phrase, and I may get this wrong, but it's Rex Quantumus, Rexus Futurus, saying the once and future king. Because there's a little bit of the story of Arthur that he's going to come back and be the great king again. Or we might tell our kids the story of Robin Hood. What's Robin Hood doing? What's Robin Hood waiting for? Robin Hood is, and his band of merry men are trying to take money from the rich and give it to the poor, yes, but they are waiting ultimately for King Richard to come back from his crusades in the Holy Lands and make everything right again by getting rid of the evil King John. What's the final book of the Lord of the Rings? the return of the king, King Aragon, who's going to come and make everything better and make everything okay. It's how we view history. We view the Battle of Trafalgar as this moment in history where Britain was outmanned and outgunned and outshipped in every way. And the great man, Admiral Nelson, came in and through his better tactics was able to save the day and make everything better. We were going to lose the Second World War until Winston Churchill was able to rally everyone behind him and get support. And all of a sudden, he, the great man was there and we were able to win in the end because of him. And we might not think it's not just things in the past, but it's how we view the present as well. I remember a few years ago, um, I went to visit a friend of mine and we were standing in his kitchen and he was watching a video on his phone of a, a town hall in the north of England. Because... He would got really excited about this backbencher from Labour who was now in the running for the leadership called Jeremy Corbyn. And my friend was watching it and thinking, this is going to be great. 
because he's going to be put into place and everything will become better because the great man will come and make everything better. That's why Trump got elected because people wanted Trump to come in, the great man to come in, the king to come in and to drain the swamp and to get rid of everything that we didn't like. It's why we might look in desperation at maybe a politician like Putin and not understand how the people of Russia could elect somebody who we don't think is terribly democratic or, or terribly fair. But it's because for the Russians, here's the great man, the king coming in, who's going to make Russia great and bring them back to their days of glory and empire. And it's not just politics either. What do you do with your phone whenever you're scrolling through TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is? and looking at people's lives who you don't know in real life. You're looking at their lives and thinking, if if I knew them, if I was friends with them, my life would just be a wee bit better. That the great person would come, the king, the hero, the savior would come, and things would be better. The difficulty is, though, is whenever we look at all these kings and all these, these straw heroes, is that they never really fully satisfy. And this isn't just a Christian thing. Everyone's beginning to notice this. There was an article in the New York Times this past week where a woman called Leah Stein uh, wrote an article on the empty religions of Instagram. She, She wrote this. She said, I was one of those millennials who had made politics their religion. I lasted three years as a feminist activist and organizer before I burned out in 2017. That's when I began noticing that on, on Instagram, there were so many wellness products and programs marketed towards women in pain and how so, the social media industry relies on keeping us outraged and engaged. It's no wonder we're seeking relief. I have hardly prayed to God since I was a teenager, but the pandemic has cracked open inside me a profound yearning for reverence, humility, and awe. I have an overdraft of outrage in my account. I want a moral authority from somebody who isn't trying to sell me a memoir or calling out their enemies on social media. I have a profound yearning for reverence, humility, and awe. I want a moral authority. There's something in our hearts is longing for this. And the issue with all of the kings we see, be they political ones, be they social media ones, be they the kings we see of history and myth of years gone by, is they will never satisfy because they aren't really true, real kings. I watched an interview this past week um, with the author uh, Jordan Peterson. Some of you are maybe aware of him. Uh, He wrote a book a few years ago that was very successful called The 12 Rules for Life that was fundamentally how to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and it was sort of a bit of a self-help book. But in the interviewer, in the interview, the interviewer was asking him about all these sort of myths and legends from history. You know, the great kings, those great people we might look up to, those people who we think are, are great and wonderful. And as Jordan Peterson began to speak, he began to say that, you know, the issue with all the great kings we might read about, like King Arthur or Robin Hood or whoever our hero might be, is all of our heroes are, are myths in some way. It's that kind of bit of advice that we know in ourselves, you know, never meet your heroes. He said, all of these heroes we see, they're not real. They're just myths. And then he begins to cry. And he begins to say, but what's really difficult is whenever you come to the person of Jesus Christ. And he says this. He says, the ultimate example of these mythical heroes entering into real history, space, and time is Jesus Christ. It just seems so oddly plausible to me. I don't know what to make of it, though, because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. That longing you have for a hero, a king, or a cause to give you meaning or purpose or direction to your life, if it is placed in something outside of Jesus, it is ultimately going to hurt you and eat you alive. Because he is the only person who we see our hopes and longings for that great future, perfect, promised king entering into reality in a way that we can reach out and feel and touch. Jesus is the only perfect king because he's the only true, historical, real, perfect king. And that's what we see in this passage as it points us to David 
it points us to a king who will be even greater than David. We might think that David's humble, but ultimately, Jesus is the true and perfect humble king. Every king, every leader, every cause that you want to give yourself to in your life will ultimately cause you, call you to come and die for it. If it's your career, it will call you to give you your life. If it's the social justice cause that you're following, it will, cause to, it will want every ounce of your anger and outrage that it can. If it's the influencer that you're following on Instagram, it will call you to give all the hours that you can to watch and engage with their content. But Jesus alone is the perfect, humble king because Jesus alone is the perfect king who doesn't ask his people to die for him. He is the king who dies for his people. That's what we read in Philippians 2, verse 8. That Jesus, though being found, in, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Every leader you're going to follow, every king or hero you might look up to in your life, will call you to come and die for their cause. But Jesus is the king who lays down his life for his people. No other king is as humble or as that. Jesus alone is the only perfect refuge. David was able to offer a refuge of Mount Zion, you know, in a fortress up on a hill, but it was only really ever going to be a temporary refuge. You know, it was ransacked by the Babylonians. It would then later be ransacked by the Romans. It clearly wasn't a good and strong enough refuge. And whatever you are relying on to make yourself feel safe other than Jesus will ultimately be like the fortress of Jerusalem. You know, it might last for a wee while, but ultimately something will make it crack. Money might be your refuge for the next wee while until you're made redundant. Success might be the thing that you retreat into to make yourself feel safe until suddenly you're turned down from that, for that promotion. Or that sense of family that you want to look to to give you that sense of safety and security to be your refuge, that will work until you have an argument and a falling out. But whenever you begin to realize that Jesus is the king who offers a true and perfect refuge, then you are find, finding a refuge that no one can take away from you. A refuge that allows you to face the greatest trials and the greatest storms. Whenever the early church was first formed and they were persecuted, one of the things that stood out to them was how these Christians could be murdered and yet show such peace. The Bishop Polycarp, whenever he went to be murdered, he prayed this. He said, I give thanks to you that you count me worthy of being numbered among your martyrs, God, that I might share in the cup of Jesus Christ, in his suffering, but also in his resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice to you. What sort of refuge is it that allows somebody to be thrown onto the fire as Polycarp was and say, I thank you that I'm allowed to take part in this? It's a refuge that realizes that our greatest hopes are found not in a cause or in a person or in power or in influence, but are found wholly in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why one of the old catechisms from the, uh, from the Reformed era, the, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, as its first question asks, what is our only hope in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, and I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus. That's our refuge and that's our hope, because that's the only refuge that can never be taken away and never be stripped from you. And it's the refuge that our King has won for us. We see that Jesus gives us the true victory. You know, David was able to give a great victory over the Philistines, but it was only ever going to be a temporary victory. The Philistines would still continue to pose problems for the people of God throughout the Bible. We'll read of future battles. We'll read of future failures. We'll read of all sorts of ways that they fail. What is the victory you think that if you get it in your life, you will have the complete and final victory? What is the one thing you are longing for in your life that you think if you can get that, if you can win that, you'll have everything? There was a writer, John Stott, who once said that hell is giving people exactly what they wanted because so often whenever we get that thing or we get that victory or we win the thing we were longing for, we discover 
It was never going to satisfy. But yet we have a Savior who gives us the greatest victory of all, who gives us victory over death itself, who, as we confess in the ancient creeds, descended to the dead, to the depths of human experience, and conquered it on our behalf, so that even the greatest obstacle in your life, that is death itself, is conquered in the name of Jesus. And then finally, Jesus alone is not just a godly king, but he's the king where we find God, because he is God himself. David will have moral failures and he will make mistakes. But Jesus is the king who is God, is perfect. And we might think this is a weird thing to think about. How can, how can Jesus be king? How can he be a real king if you know, we can't physically reach out and touch and hold him, if we can't physically see him? Um, the Westminster Larger Catechism has a great line in it, which I think sums it up really well which is, how does Christ execute his office as king? And it says that Christ executes his offer as king by calling a people to himself from out of the world. What does it mean to follow King Jesus, who is God? It means to hear his call and to go to him. And as the catechism will later go on to say, to have bestowed upon you saving grace that you might be given reward for all of your obedience, that Jesus would correct you from your sins and preserve and support you under every temptation and suffering, restraining and overcoming all of your enemies and powerfully ordering all things for his glory and your good. That's what it means to be under the kingship of Jesus, to be called to him, to receive saving grace through him, and to be sustained and preserved by him for his glory, but for your good. This is why Jesus isn't a great king. Jesus is the perfect king that no other earthly king will ever come close to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus gives us hope. He gives us refuge. He gives us peace. He gives us victory. But above all, he gives us access to you, whereby we can pray in your name and we can rejoice that we have a king who is greater than any king of this world. Would we praise and glorify and honor him in all we think, do, and say? For it's in his blessed name, we ask. Amen.